Hey guys, I'm back. Um, you guys liked my last video where I uh, reacted and analyzed Jeff Costellucci's cover of Saddle Up. Uh, I got more views than I usually do, which wasn't that many. It was like 30 people so far. That's more than I'm used to getting. So thank you for that. And I even got some comments asking for things I should break down next time. So this is next time. This time we're reacting to Jeff's cover of Misty Mountains. From, uh, it's the song from The Hobbit. Which I'll admit to you guys, I haven't seen. People have told me I should watch it. But I know the song. I've heard all different, I've heard every arrangement of it. Um, so like I said before, I have heard this before. This isn't my raw reaction. I'm just breaking it down, analyzing it from the standpoint of somebody who does arrangements like this. Um, so I'm not going to blabber much more. I, I want to get right into it. This is one of my favorite Jeff arrangements. I really like it. It's very beautiful. So let's get right into it. Loving the fake facial hair. Also, you guys should know that bagpipes are my third favorite instrument of all time. You don't get to know what the top two are yet, but I love the use of bagpipes in musical arrangements. Also, I mentioned this in Saddle Up, but one thing that you always see right away in Jeff's arrangements is the acting, and it, it it's really good at drawing the, the viewers in. So I, I really think that's something he does really well. He's a very good actor in his music videos. So one thing that I really appreciate about this arrangement is that it's a very slow song, especially in his interpretation. I mean, it's a slow song to begin with, but um, he's using a lot of patience building up to different points, which you'll hear as the song goes on, obviously. But um, we don't hear any lyrics until the f until like 40 seconds in. And that's a bold choice because um, people tend to lose interest if you're not doing something interesting right away. But that's another thing, like the way he arranges it with the bagpipes and the strings in the background. It's something that's really satisfying to listen to just because of the melody. Like, obviously, he didn't compose it, but um, it's something that people are familiar with and something that people like to hear. Um, and then when he drops the G1 subharmonic, right, when the bagpipes hit the, uh, hit the root, um, I don't know, it just draws you in. And I think that's really good because you want to be drawn in if he's not going to start singing for 40 seconds. So I really I really commend Jeff's pacing in this arrangement, how he's not rushing to get to something cool. He just lets it come naturally, which might take a little longer for a song as slow as this. So when you arrange a piece of music, you really want to understand the tone of the original piece and the tone that you're trying to convey. Because um you could this would be very different if somebody was doing a metal cover of it, naturally. Um so I think Jeff really understands that he's going for like a darker, almost soothing tone, like mellow and mysterious. Um so I think it's really fitting that like the for the very first line that he sings. It's just the soloist's voice. And then for the second line, all he adds is the is like two or three of the background voices doing like very low background harmonies. And it really emphasizes the mellow quiet effect we're going for for this video. So I think that's a good arrangement technique. You really need to understand the tone you're trying to convey. And Jeff does that really well here. We must away. One thing I'll comment on is I feel like a lot of the time these bass singers who do these cool covers just to show off their range, um, they they try to show off their range too much. 
And I'm saying, I'm reading this up because I don't think Jeff does that very often. I think it, uh, most of the time, most of the time it feels earned when he hits, uh, when he goes like down into the subharmonic register like that. Um, and that is like, that is also helped by the arrangement because something not a lot of people will hear when they're listening to this for like the first few times, um, is how there's like a flute. I think it's a flute. Maybe it's a violin in the background just like builds for like a couple measures before until he hits the G1 and then it just fades out, which again, a lot of people aren't going to notice unless they're really trying to analyze the piece. But that also makes it feel like he, we had proper build up to the G1 and he hits the G1 with a good enough tone that it feels rewarding and not like, oh, it, like, not like it juts out. So again, this is a very commendable arrangement. Did you hear the instruments building up? The pines were roaring. We're a minute and I guess 15 seconds in when he finally brings in percussion. On the hide, the wind was moaning in the night. The fire was red. So another thing, if you're arranging something, if you're arranging like a vocal uh, performance like this, a cover, is being very wary of what the background voices are doing in terms of syllables. Because uh, I'll tell you guys, I'm taking music courses like choir classes for college right now. And um, one thing, the one of the biggest things I've learned is the importance of the syllable you're using if you're singing like a background part or something. Because if you have like a very full tone, like an aww, oh, or an ooh, it's going to sound very different than if you have like an eh ah or an ah. Um, so you have to be very conscious of the uh, syllables you're using, the vowel sounds. Um, so I think it's good that he uses just like the humming or a low ooh for a lot of this, but he switches to an ah, like we just heard a couple lines ago. He switches to that at a time where it doesn't feel out of place. So the biggest thing with this arrangement that I keep coming back to is pacing. He Sorry, he doesn't take too long to get anywhere. It's It always feels well-paced, like he's getting to the place, he's arriving to impact points exactly when he's supposed to. Breathe like torches blazed with This is one of my favorite parts of the arrangement where it goes into the um this next verse and the uh, I guess I we call it the second part um um the Jeff to the uh, left of the soloist on our screen uh, he adds a harmony that his harmony sounds like it would be in a major key which I don't know I didn't like break down what the exact pitches were but um if you're writing an arrangement like this you always have to experiment with harmonies and find out what works where because um. Like, just doing a third or a fifth harmony doesn't always work. You have to find the best places to work. So when he's doing the fifth harmony here, it adds a lot of openness to the sound. And, like, we have, like, that big mellow opening, and this feels more like it's building because he's using the fourth harmonies. Um, so the soloist goes, oh, uh, um, I can't hit the D. Oh, 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 oh. Um, like, the weather heat. And the and the harmony goes the way the way I lost it. I'm sorry. You guys had to hear me sing. But the important thing I'm getting to is the open fifth harmony that he's doing between the first two parts. It really adds a lot to the openness of the piece and allowing it to progress and build properly. So I, I'll try not to sing anymore. I'll get on with this. Do you hear how open it sounds between the melody and the harmony there? The shadows lurk. 
And I'm gonna be honest with you guys, that's one of the rare times where I don't think the subharmonic fits very well with the piece. Um, it's cool, it sounds really cool, but um, I don't know, I just feel like it kind of like the syllable, the lay syllable, it kind of like uh cuts through in a way that like it makes it sound more crass than it's supposed to, but that's just me, maybe you disagree. <laughs> So we're getting to my favorite part. Often when you have an arrangement with a repetitive melody, where like all the verses use the same melody and there's not really a chorus, kind of like uh, what a lot of hymns and folk songs will do. Um, if you're doing a cover or an arrangement like this with a solo and the three background vocals, it's really important to mix up the style that you use for the different verses. And that's not like the pentatonic 12, 12 Days of Christmas, where every line you use a different style. That's cool. But... um. I like how for the first two verses of the song, it's just quiet. It's just the one solo Jeff and then the three in the background doing the low, mellow harmonies. And then in the third verse, he opens up with the uh, perfect fifth harmonies. Um, so where do you go from there? What do you do to change up the melody? And I like what he does where he cuts out the soloist for a second right here where we're about to hear. And it's just the three background vocals doing the melody as a three-part harmony. And, it, and it's like a creative new direction to take the arrangement. So I think this is a really good decision that sounds it's so cool. It sounds really pretty. You hear how it just breaks into three parts quietly and it cuts out the rest of the instruments. It adds such a cool tone to the piece. I must admit, I don't really, I can't really tell if that's head voice or um, maybe a low falsetto or just a side chest voice because it sounds really clean if it's chest voice that high. Um, but I also don't doubt Jack because he has a really good high baritone range too. Um, but I think that impact really, it's really emphasized by the tone that the background Jeffs are using. Like he can really put on different tones depending on what he's trying to convey in his voice. And I think that's really good. I think the impact just sounds so good with the three Jeffs playing the background. Um, like they're hanging to the side, they have their own tone because they know that they're just backing up the lead singer. So I think that adds a lot to the impact, like people knowing their place. I'll be honest, a lot of the time if I'm singing with a group, I'll try to be the star of the show even when I'm not, just because like I haven't broken that habit yet. But sometimes it is important to be the background and it's good that like Jeff's able to do that in his own arrangement too, even though he doesn't have to share the stage with anybody. And man, people talk about the subharmonics, but I always go back and listen to that like dip down into the first register. I think that's it sounds really freaking cool. Come on, it's so good. It sounds so rich and deep and I love it. So as we're winding down, I want to comment on how the piece kind of unravels itself. Like we lost the bagpipes and the violins a while ago, but now we're starting to lose the percussion. If we go back a few seconds, we'll hear it fade out. And eventually we do lose the voices too, or the background voices. just cuts out to that one low soft note which by the way i'm pretty sure he's doing that in chest voice that g1 
It's like a breathy chest voice, and that's that's impressive enough on its own. But the fact that he's able to have so much control over it that it fits the tone of the piece so well, it's just like it's, it's so wildly impressive. And I know like that's not that's not news. Like Jeff is a very impressive singer, arranger, performer, everything. Um, but like everything about this arrangement, it's one of my favorites that he's done. I think it's like it's nearly immaculate. It's just so good. Um, so I get I'll let it play out to the end because I didn't. Not everything has to have a big, loud ending, especially if you're in this like quieter, more mellow tone. And I really appreciate that. Like Jeff does, Jeff does a lot of these like heavy blues covers, like House of the Rising Sun or Sixteen Tons. Um, but it, it, this really shows how rounded of a performer he is. He's able to do a lot of different styles, and he's able to nail them really well. And I can't tell you how happy this arrangement makes me. It's one of like four or five of his arrangements that I listen to all the time. I just love it. Um, and I also wanted to talk about a comment somebody put on the last video about what makes this sound like Jeff Costellucci. Because obviously it has his voice and his voice is kind of iconic at this point. But um, somebody said that it's very easy to pick out when it's an arrangement that uh, Jeff or even Lane made for voice play. If you don't know, voice play is the acapella group that Jeff sings with and arranges for. Um and that's a really good question that I'm going to try to unpack more as we do these. But one thing that I did think of is a lot of cover artists, um, like I think of Peter Hollins and Jonathan Young and Caleb Piles, they're all like artists that I really love to listen to, but they all have their own unique style, especially since like, I think that the best person to say would probably be Peter Hollins because he does acapella stuff. And this isn't acapella, but like it's close. The voice play does, does acapella. Um, but when you hear Peter Hollins, a lot of his stuff that he does is like folk songs um, or like hymns or like Disney songs he has a lot of. Um, and I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell like what the difference is in the way they arrange. And I feel like a good arranger knows their voice know, and knows the voices they're writing for. Um, if you watch Jeff's video, he has a video that I can put an info card for where he talks about how he arranges music for voice play. And he says that um, when he finishes the arrangement, he sends it through every other guy in voice play and they all review it and tell him things that they think he should change. Um, so that's definitely part of it. Um, like if you listen to Home Free or Pentatonix or voice play or like other acapella artists, Peter Hollins, I like Tommy P, shout out to him. They all write, they all write arrangements that fit their tone like the way their voice is, their style that they can best achieve. Um, and it's good to deviate. But at the same time, it's also like you have to know who you're writing for. So a lot of the time, like if you listen to Pentatonix, you get the more pop feel, um, like modern, modern, like hip hop, pop. If you get home free, you usually get country. If you go to voice play, you'll get like a lot of the time it's like, um, it's very jazzy or very, um, or very uh, a lot like this arrangement um or 16 tones like funky like in your face um i think out of the three voice plays the one that tends to be like in your face the most like blow you away with their arrangement and it's just because like jeff and lane are both really good arrangers and i don't know if anyone else arranges for voice play i honestly don't because i haven't looked into that that much um but it's an interesting question. Like, what makes a piece sound like it's from a specific group? It's definitely a lot with the voices. It's definitely not with no, a lot with knowing who you're arranging for and what their voices are capable of. But that is definitely something we can talk about in a later video. But this video is already getting pretty long. So I'm going to end it here. Um, I will be back with more videos soon. So that's all for this video. And I will see you guys later.